Let's go ahead and get started then with the second half of the program. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Kevin Bachhuber. Uh, I'm not uh, positive what he calls uh, his title at the uh, Big Cricket Farm, but I'll let him introduce himself better if he needs to. Okay. I'm Kevin Bachhuber. I have a permanent title. Uh, I'm the founder of Big Cricket Farms. Um, is this a touch screen or not? I just got used to using a touch screen computer, so you might get fingerprints by the end of this thing. <coughs> uh, we were the first, we we're the first um, FDA and Ohio Department of Agriculture inspected, and uh, I won't say approved because you can get a good long lecture from uh, the regulatory authorities on that. Uh, before I get too deep into this, I want to acknowledge um, I don't usually make PowerPoints because I go dramatically off script. Expect this to be no different. Uh, but uh, we were founded in 2014. We had our first uh, initial cricket farm in Youngstown, Ohio. We'll get into why I'm referring to that that way in a little bit. Uh, it's been fascinating being a portion of this uh, industry right as it's coming up and coming to be in the U.S. In a lot of the way, in a lot of ways, the U.S. really has a lot of catching up to do with the rest of the world, as you see in all of the FAO reports and infographics and things like that. Um, there's also something that you know we need to pause and acknowledge when we talk about uh, cricket farming and other edible insects in the U.S. And we need to acknowledge the efforts of the people who raise insects for animal feed. You know, the oldest cricket farm in the U.S. is 67 years old. It occupies 100, 130,000 square feet over a three and a half square block area in the same city where Duck Dynasty is filmed. Um, they produce somewhere between one and three billion insects per year. Um, all sold on the live market. We've been working with them for a while since our own plant went down to kind of get them up to grade. Um, but it's important to recognize that there are existing in the U.S. probably about 300 uh, insect farms that are for animal feed, for food, those types of purposes. And when you look at the way that food and feed develops in other nations or in other industries or other materials, you'll, you'll see that typically 5% of what's raised goes to human food, and the other 95% goes to animal feed in some way or another. That 5% that is for human food really drives the rest of the industry. People have this weird thing. They, wanna eat, they want their animals to eat what they eat, regardless of what's good for the animal. Uh, but that's really what drives it. So I'm fascinated by the culinary aspects of edible insects and the potential that they um, bring to the table. You know, I first got interested in this topic in 2006 when I went to Thailand, did the typical thing, ate bugs, liked them, they're great with beer. Um, and that is, I like beer, I'm from Wisconsin, you know? <laughs> and that's really been um, fascinating to uh, work with a bunch of like the culinary institutes, some of the best chefs in the U.S. and really see what kind of flavors can be pulled out and acknowledged. Um, and this is part one of going off script, obviously, is that um, when you see like the current crop of consumer-facing products that have been made, the protein bars that we just tried, the chips, the cookies, that kind of stuff, um, it's in many ways very uncreative. It's um, not something that I think you're going to see like a large market capitalization from 10 years down the line. It's an okay starting point. Um, I don't like sugar very much, so I've just been <laughs> against it from the beginning, I guess. Um, I think that you can see a lot of evidence of the um, early state of the industry in the products that we just tasted. That first um, protein bar that we tried, that after that strong aftertaste that you felt or tasted, that's actually a side effect of the processing. Um, it's the way that the crickets are brought to heat, how long they're held there, <clears throat> and how they're cooled down. 
really dramatically affects the flavor. So, I mean, we talk a lot about food and bioflavorants, things like that. You need to be aware that each step of the process influences the taste of the bugs. Um, and then you get into some of the cool stuff. So your, your protein powder, right, is the dried milled crickets that you see, they're okay. Um, you know, they, they are relatively bioavailable. Um, when you get into the people who are making like water-soluble protein powders, though, that's where you really see the nutritional benefits being able to be unlocked. Um, all of a sudden, instead of having a dried powder that's probably about 30% chitin, which is 8% um, of humans have uh, bacteria in their uh, guts that can decompose uh, or can digest chitin into bioavailable protein. The other 92% of us don't. Um, so when you're using like just those very simple kind of primitive processing techniques, you're really not getting as much of a benefit out of it. When you move into these water-soluble things, they're much easier to digest in the gut. There's a little bit more breakdown, pre-digestion that's already happened, and you're really getting those robust nutritional effects. If you want to know more, you should write a research grant for it and study it for three to five years. <coughs> Anyways. Going back on script again. This is our most common question we got in Youngstown. Um, you know, this is Republic Rubber, one of my favorite steel mills in Youngstown. It has been out of business for a little while, as has most of Youngstown. Um, you know, when I go to places that aren't Ohio, I have to explain that Youngstown, you know, on September 19th, 1977, a day forever known as Black Monday, 5,000 people were fired from Youngstown sheet and tube as of that Friday. So 5,000 people lost their job, four day notice, and that's why when you are bored in the break room and staring at the uh, labor laws, there's the 60 day minimum for mass layoffs. Came from this event. Over the next two years, 40,000 more jobs left the area and the population dwindled from 200,000 to a current population of around 59,000. It is grim, it's very grim. Um, farming doesn't <coughs> happen in nice places. Farming happens in the rurbs, in the very rural portions of the world, and farming happens in decomposed inner cores. So we figured that we would get really good right away working in these environments. And it was tough. I mean, this was our initial kind of setting everything up. This is what we grew into, and then we never took the final portions when it was uh, much more developed. All right, I couldn't find any pictures when I was making the slideshow. Um, so that's pictures. So this is relatively recent. Um, about a year ago, we started having problems where um, our entire colony would die um, unexpectedly up and you know, out of nowhere. About a year after we started having problems, um, the city let us know by way of letter that they had failed the last four uh, consecutive water quality tests. It later turned out that the mayor of Youngstown had been stealing water money and giving it to his friends under the economic development. And so the water is up to five times worse than Flint's. So we decided to move. <coughs> um, we came into this knowing that there would be a lot of disenfranchisement, disempowerment, that kind of thing. And it's just that moment when if you don't have water, you don't have anything. So I'm really glad we got these emojis made, like a year ago, by the way. <laughs> um, it's been a really good learning opportunity. We've had a lot of time to really get um, a lot of connections to really be able to develop a robust idea of how this industry is going to develop over the next 20 to 30 years. And it's nice to be able to walk away from Young Sound with that knowledge. That being said, we are moving. Um, we'll be finalizing our move in the next two weeks. and. Um, Talk about it then.
<laughs> so our next steps, uh, there is consistently throughout the time that we've done this, been far more demand than we can handle. We've gotten to know a lot of other people who are infrastructure builders, who are supply chain specialists, who are farmers. So we're working on increasing the supply, getting the rest of the stakeholders that we need to get this thing moving properly, um, going, getting into that processing and value added agreement, ingredients uh, world, and then moving into the distribution efficiency. I had a transition in here and I forgot it. So I'm just going to show you this guy's picture instead. Um, this guy's actually a, a beard model for Gillette, uh, who is overly excited when he got his crickets. Uh, the big question that I'm here to talk to you about today is, once you have your bugs, how do you cook them? This is just a small representation of different products and different recipes and different dishes that um, we've been able to do with people over the last couple of years. There are, when you get into the indigenous uh, bug eating recipes with the help of like friendly translators, it's staggering to realize the length and depth of what you can do with bugs that you just simply can't do with beef. Um, and I feel like we've barely scratched the surface of it. But as long as they're scratching surfaces. I mean, when you look at traditional applications, you see a lot of bugs being eaten raw, right out of the wild, sometimes still alive, uh, which we judge the American market was not ready for. <coughs> you know, I, uh, I personally, we've had a lot of press, um, and we've had a lot of very well-regarded people come to Youngstown, Ohio, and, uh, you know, feed them bugs. So I personally like the sautéed, roasted, and fried when you are uh, convincing someone to try bugs for the first time. Fairly quickly, though, you realize that the actual applications that see the most use. I'm sad that uh, Dr. Cohen, yeah, yeah. yeah, already left because uh, he was kind of muttering about, I'm not sure who eats these things. <laughs> um, I see bugs get extracted into sauces as colorants, flavorants, all the time. Um, you see the shells being used to uh, make soup stock, the same way that you might make a shrimp stock or a chicken stock. Um, there are some truly amazing soups that if you ever get over to Thailand, uh, you should really give them a shot. Um, and then you get into like the fermented stuff. Uh, there's a fair amount of fermentation products that happen because you can make miso out of crickets. And it's apparently been being done for a couple thousand years and uh, those guys are good at it. I've had some uh, um, giant hornet whiskey that's, uh, you know, you brew it with the, the Japanese giant hornet attacks hives of the uh, Japanese honeybee and so <laughs> you catch them together I guess take the honey, ferment the honey with the hornets in it, and it's its own little like ecosystem of uh, predatory analysis in a bottle. Um, when you get into the novel applications, the ones that require more robust processing, you start getting into the powders, the tofu replacements, your cricket Cheetos, um, your cricket Krispies. I don't know that any of these products have like hit the retail market yet, but um, I get a lot of samples in the P.O. box. So <laughs> just a small amount of what I've seen. Um, you know, when you get into it, I totally forgot to put the uh, scientific names in half this. Anyways, um, when you get into it, and we talk, hear a lot of talk about how there's 1,900 or 2,400 or whatever edible insect species that have been already identified. Um, it really helps to stop and take a moment to really think about what kind of diversity of flavor, texture, etc. you see. The crickets and the mealworms that are, and the black soldier flies, that are uh, used right now are mild and inoffensive in flavor. They're not too different from anything that somebody might expect. Um, then you get into like saga. I had a Sago larvae was one of the big ones in Thailand, which is um, 
a large, white, kind of terrifying looking grub that tastes exactly like bacon. That's that kind of thing that you can sell to a million hipsters. Um, you know, lemon ant, you get into these things where like, there's a, a formic acid uh, is particular to ants. It has a very kind of tart, lemony flavor to it. <coughs> um, but you also get your, lemon, your honey ants where the grape size back ends are filled with their, uh, I believe the polite word is nectar. <laughs> and you get into your giant water beetles that are just like, you know, you get into these like fruit flavored bugs very naturally. Um, there's a lot of lobster in the world of edible insects. Um, and these are all wide open for us to start moving our culinary tastes into. So on that note, we've been working with chefs, culinary institutions, and other interested parties for the last couple of years to um, really explore what flavors and what recipes can be pulled out of the bugs, even on a very basic, unprocessed whole insect basis. Um, I'm all about the whole bugs. Like, I hear people make the argument about novelty, about disgust, about whatever. I also see the argument that there are, you know, 30 million people who originate from um, Southeast Asia and China and America, and I get emails from them all the time where people say, my grandma has been here for 37 years. The only thing that she's ever missed from Vietnam was being able to make, you know, her homemade deep fried crickets. And like, now she can, thanks to you. I know, right? You're like bawling, voiding the warranty on your computer from the... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I can't give Chef Bradley Miller enough props. Um, and this small selection of pictures does not even close to do justice to what uh, he's made with us. He's a master saucier. Um, his specialty, the Susie's Dogs and Drafts, is one of those, I think there's a Columbus equivalent where it's like a hot dog place with like 40 different, uh, 40 or 50 different um, condiments on it. I don't, I don't know. In Cleveland there's one. I assume there would be one here too. Um, We've had a lot of fun making cricket pastos, making you know, uh, cricket marinades, just trying out different things there. Uh, we've done some interesting fermentations that I wouldn't recommend repeating. Uh, you get some disasters along the way. Uh, working with Brett, Brad and I together have <coughs> worked with and prepared meals for um, over four, or for a little more than 40 sets of the national and international press, ranging from kind of uh, your, your small scale documentarians up through CNN, um, major Japanese news outlets. And we try to do something different each time with them. So it's been crazy <coughs> to see uh, cricket mustard being made, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so after we did this with Brad for a while, we kind of by chance ended up um, going to a culinary institute. And it turned out that I was expected to teach a class. <laughs> Which uh, is why I'm glad that I can go off script pretty easily. <laughs> um, this is the first time that we visited the International Culinary Arts Institute. They made braised lamb with uh, cricket pesto on it. They made churros <laughs> that were to die for. Um, it was good. And then one of the ways that we've really, or one of the ways that helps push insects into people's kitchens is online recipe websites. When you look at them, you know, if you can go to Epicurious or cooks.com or whatever, recipes.com, you type in cricket a couple of years ago, you would have zero entries. Now you have more. I'm not saying a lot, but more. Um, so one of the things that we got to do with International Culinary Arts Institute was host a couple of people from Epicurious who have been, um, do people know what Epicurious is? <coughs> By show of nods or shakes? Okay, cool. 
but I'm not going to explain it. Um, so this is what we, you know, this is what uh, Chef Sean Kulp and his students whipped up for uh, Epicurious. The I have to say the cricket horseradish crusted beef with twice baked potato and seasonal vegetable was to die for. Uh, I haven't had a whole lot of sous vide prepared beef before. Um, I'd go for it. You know, it's important when you're talking about co cooking to recognize that the um, that the strong positions that are sometimes taken in our young industry <coughs> are um, probably unnecessary. I mean, let's be real, crickets are not replacing steak. Replacing soy? Yeah, totally. But, you know, crusting steak? Definitely. But you're not going to hit, like, the flavor and keynotes that you want out of your tenderloin from a cricket. Um, so we really, in a lot of this stuff, we're using the, the a uh, whole insect is an accent. Um, it's when we started doing this kind of thing, it was very much a novelty aspect, um, and now it's more just like the tasty topper. We had a lot of fun experimenting with a lot of the flavoring that you hear stories about. Uh, we did the rosemary apple crickets, we did the cinnamon crickets, the mint crickets, uh, and we did the basil crickets. So I mean. All turned out pretty well. The, we tried to do cilantro lime. Uh, turns out crickets won't eat citrus, so they were just cilantro crickets. Mm. But they do love watermelon, and none of that flavor comes through. So uh, they are what they eat. This was one of the other really crazy ones. Um, we were Jan uh, Anthony Zimmern's people, because he has people, uh, reached out to us at the same time that Le Cordon Bleu asked us to come and um, you know, talk with their students and with their staff about how to do it. We ended up going to a James Beard event with them, um, and these were their products. That was uh, Andrew Zimmern's uh, opinion of the product. You know, you see a lot of these larger chefs getting into talking about yeah, cricket as an accent is nice, but like, what about a far more dominant presence in the meal? And that's what, as somebody who you know sells crickets, I like to hear that. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is where we're going to see the culinary growth in the industry. We need more bugs, we, with an emphasis on that food safety and the wholesomeness and the best practices. Did you get that uh, FDA Cornerstone Group? Memo? Yeah. I'll have to forward it to you. Wholesomeness now makes an appearance like twice in the uh, regs or in the recommendations. Um, you know, when we work with the FDA, when we work with State Department of Agriculture, there's kind of a couple different things that they're really looking for, and then after that, they don't care as much. You know, they want good labeling, they want um, <coughs> the bugs to be wholesome and the entire supply chain from hatch to end consumer to be food and food grade. You know, there's a lot, they use the word wholesomeness a lot and filth more often than you would think government official publications would uh, use. In terms of really bringing the culinary insect to the fore, there's a lot of room for um, culinary experimentation whether it's professional chefs that I wish I could show you pictures of their stuff, but they haven't been published yet, so I can't. Um, I was paging through pictures, trying to find what to put on this, and there's all these things that it's like, I have a little note on them, unreleased till July, unreleased till October. Um, and then the other side is going to be that industrial processing. I mean, we look at these water-soluble protein powders, we look at these tofu replacements, and then we look at some of the more novel applications like 3D printed buckyballs made out of uh, you know, insect protein and a little bit of like potato starch, <coughs> which will probably not catch on for the large scale, but it was pretty cool to see. Um, and then one that I was going to put on there was uh, just straight up kitchen table experimentation. 
you know, I think that as we see, I mean, not to put too many spoilers <coughs> on there, but as we see right around September, um, a lot of insects hitting the grocery store shelves, I think we'll see an explosion of those recipes coming through. And then, I mean, the applica applications are going to be, there's all of that work on the ready-to-use curative foods, on the malnutrition side of things, where we're taking something that is that has a lot fewer inputs and producing something that is uh, truly able to bring people out of a malnutritive state and uh, save lives. A lot of that's going to revolve around the shelf stabilization problems. I know that you contend with it as just as much as we do. Exactly. Yeah, right. I, well, I could. Um, no, I mean, yes. We'll see a lot of, uh, as the allergen kind of plague has consumed <coughs> our country, we're gonna see, there's a need for that food diversity. Um, I don't think that the major applications are going to be in the U.S. on the uh, kids' food market quite as strong as... You know, you see it in Thailand, I think it's a lot, where they've done a lot of those pilot studies, and um, it truly is amazing. I mean, throughout Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, um, insects and arachnids may be the only source of protein that children receive up till, other than mother's milk, up till age six or eight, um, and in some cases up into early adolescence. And when there's been robust supply, um, the same thing that Glenn's saying about seeing uh, better brain development, about seeing you know bodies that are less frail. Um, it's really impressive. I mean, it's just kind of your side by sides are crazy uh, to see. I feel like a lot of them are like 50 to 70 milli or 50 to 70 grams of protein over like a 24 hour period. Is that what you remember? Mm -hmm. And I mean, the other thing that I'll throw in there is that when you look at the whole food chain, um, one of the secrets of uh, one of the old cricket farmers down in the southeast um, of the U.S. is so they produce uh, six tons of cricket poop a week. Um, crickets are not cellulose digesters. They're 
I don't know, the digestive tract is pretty close to like a chicken's, but they only strip the lightest layers of nutrients out. Um, and the feed that's left over and the poop and the molts all kind of get aggregated together and they go off to a hog farmer who uses it as sole ration. And his hogs have such glossy coats, you would not believe it. Um, the insects are only stripping a small amount of nutrients off of what they're eating, um, at least for our inefficient digesters. Um, and it adds another step to the food chain too, right? So what you're saying, with what you're saying, the one caveat that I'll say is it's going to come down a lot to processing. You know, if you thoroughly mush up the bugs, dry them out on a, and then like spray dry them against a drum. Um, you know, your bioavailability is going to be a lot lower. It really, you know, processing is really a critical component when you're talking about the uh, oldest and youngest among us. That's industry standard for most bug based. No, I mean, like, those are all very valid points. Um, this is, I was staring at this going, I assume that we would all be, uh, that a lot of times when I go to university, there's a lot of 22-year-olds who want to know what they can do when they graduate. So these next couple of slides are for them. Um, again, I love this emoji pack. <laughs> um, these are my questions. We always go through the research slide of what questions are there. And mine are, can I eat it? How could it kill me if I do? This didn't kill me when I ate it. Okay. So who could be, and this is some questions that I feel like are not really getting enough space in the current discussions about edible insects, these last two. Who could be harmed by me eating this? You need to remember that we're not playing the price game. Um, I'm going to point to quinoa as an example of the bioethics of food being poorly played out. The Andean indigenous people who um, make their living both by raising and selling the quinoa and use it as a staple have been um, <coughs> horrifically priced out of the market by American investors coming in and building large scale quinoa farms. Quinoa can only be raised at uh, 6,000 feet elevations are above um, and there have been a couple of large conglomerates that have come through and um, committed some acts of economic devastation against the indigenous people who own that food. As we're getting further and further into edible insects, we need to be very aware that real people's real lives are based on these bugs. We need to think about that in terms of pricing. We need to think about that in terms of scaling. We need to think about that in terms of regulation and barriers to entry. Um, this is something that if you join us at Edible Insects Detroit, you'll be able to see me on the ethics forum talking about exactly this issue, along with um, female empowerment and kind of the issue of erasure um, that I think also needs to be contended with. And then there's sustainability. What could be harmed by me eating this? In addition to the conversation about sustainability that already exists, and I will correct the official number after a couple of years of doing this, uh, your entire supply chain cost of water is 49 to 51 gallons uh, for a pound of crickets, which is still a hell of a lot better than the 1,768 gallons of water for one pound of beef that CNN told us it was. I trust the researchers. Um, so, you know, the, the one to two gallons of water for one pound of crickets is a little disingenuous when you compare it to like the 2,000 gallons of water 
it's, but um, 50 gallons versus 2,000 is still saving just about 2,000 gallons of water. <laughs> But uh, we need to be having a more rigorous discussion about what happens if and when these bugs escape. Um, what's good for us on the US side is that the crickets that are raised in cricket farms are fully domesticated. They are incapable of surviving outside their little egg carton-based homes. Um, and when they escape, if you put egg cartons on the floor, they come in in the morning and there's all your crickets that escaped <laughs> clustering on those. <coughs> they don't like concrete, they like egg cartons. This is not true of all bugs, though. You know, uh, this has been a real consideration, um, particularly I'm Jewish, one of the ten plagues. Like, I have no wish to recreate a plague of locusts upon the land, uh, which is why we did crickets and not locusts. Um, but we really need to think about that. When Hurricane um, Katrina hit, it... Um, demolished one of the buildings at one of the larger cricket farms in the U.S. And um, they actually, the EPA came out and did a study on it. And they found that the bird population in the area tripled, uh, <laughs> but the crickets did not significantly increase. Uh, the guys up north, um, Crazy Carl, Crazy Carl's Crickets in Maine, who's the most north-facing cricket farmer in the U.S., um, has specially bred his crickets to only need 78 degrees Fahrenheit rather than the 90 to 95 that we typically use. But even his crickets cannot survive a main winter. He's totally safe. You know, if that facility is demolished, they got one season to make a menace of themselves. <coughs> when we're looking down at South Central America, where there have been some companies that have been looking at consolidating and doing some large scale things, you don't have a natural die off like that. You want to make sure, like, the reason that there are three different types of crickets that are raised for animal or human food in the U.S. is that the other 897 are typically considered agricultural pests. Uh, it's the same reason that we're not doing giant hornworms or uh, tobacco hornworms or tomato hornworms as our main entrant to the bug industry, is that if those things got out, they could devastate American agriculture more than it already is. Uh, <laughs> Particularly with the way that we farm in monocultures, we need to be very careful about the unintended consequences. Australia and Hawaii can show you hundreds of examples of invasive species gone horrifically awry. Everything from pigs to the yuck toad to uh, the toad so sturdy you can run it over with a truck and just swallow its innards back up and bounce away. Um, we need to be thinking about this stuff, you know. Um, the rats that you know killed out the dodos, that kind of thing. Bugs, particularly if you look on page 112 or something that FAO report, it's got all the characteristics of bugs that are well suited to be farmed. Those are also the characteristics of bugs that are well suited to ecologically devastate an area. When we talk about sustainability, we cannot have that conversation without talking about externalities and unintended consequences. That's my most finger pointing section of this. Um, and then when you get into the production and marketing, right, you're like, again, how could this kill me when I eat it? It's an important question. Always going to ask it. And then you get into the marketing. How do I convince everyone else to eat it? How do I let everyone know what's in it? How do I let everyone eat it? Um, one of the things that we've been struggling with is uh, translation services and culturally appropriate marketing for the existing cultures that live in the U.S. in large numbers. Um, and eat bugs. You know, we did, um, since Pittsburgh is so close to Youngstown, we did amazing business with everybody's Thai grandma and everyone's Burmese grandma. Um, but we, you know, two years of searching, we're really unable to find out, find a good way to appeal to that specific cultural market. Um, Everybody who knows people in the foreign language marketing program should uh, have them email me. <laughs> uh, and then fulfillment, that last mile problem. How are we getting products to customers' stores? I think it's still a largely unresolved problem in the edible insect industry. Um, and this is, again, for all the 22-year-olds that would often be in our audiences, um, based on your personality type. 
you know, this is where I would get involved if I was someone who liked clear instructions. Ground floor and skilled workers, apprenticeships, entry level, internships. Um, if you have a long attention span, because those shelf life, life stability tests, they uh, take a bit, huh? Yeah. And then the phase two on them can be three or five years while they see, like, how long does it take for this stuff to go rancid? So if you like watching paint dry, uh, shelf stabilization studies are your best option. I see that look on your face, too. You're like, oh my god, my life. I know. <laughs> um, there's a lot of room for research and development. There's a lot of room, you know, for taking that time that you would normally be bumming on parents' couches and instead doing a postdoc research project. Um, and then if you have a problem with authority, I would highly suggest the entrepreneurship route. You know? <laughs> That's why I'm where I am. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> just the rest of the team. I'll be out on my lonesome. I'm best out of the building, not annoying people at work. Questions? I thought so. <laughs> Uh, the question is about whether um, uh, crickets have a place in small-scale integrated food systems, if I'm understanding correctly. Yeah, I mean, like, they fit alongside with, you know, chickens, bees, that kind of thing. Um, the standard retail price for live crickets is, and has been for about 30 years, is about $20 a pound. As long as you don't erode at margins, there's a decent value for like your local food markets for that. As well as, I mean, they're fun to raise and they're relatively easy as long as your water isn't filled with chlorine. Um, so, I mean, they're, you know, I talk to people all the time who raise for the feed market. And they maybe have a garage or they've got a couple bins and they're supplying to like Bob's Bait Shop. Um, and it works. I mean, it works, you see, you know, Somebody's had the same garage for 40 years and it's just lack of desire or lack of children that keeps them from scaling it up. Is there a, like a how-to guide along those lines? <sighs> yes, it's not like it's fifth round of revisions and we're not gonna release it till we're damn well and ready. Um, Fluker Farms in late 90s, early 2000s put out a um, little like how to raise crickets in your classroom for K through six teachers. I would recommend that as a good starting point. Um, you can even answer the little questions for the kids after you've raised a couple generations. Have you seen that the native population that's coming over from the United mm -hmm. Expats. Do they raise their own crickets? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Um, and I mean it's that same small scale integrated system where they're not only raising crickets, they're raising like food pigeons, or they're raising um, uh, guinea pigs, you know, for food, that kind of thing. Um, yes, you see a lot of it, but um, second generation expats have dramatically less attention span for um, kind of keeping practices alive. And if they can go and buy bugs for grandma at the store, they'll do it. Um, I actually don't consider raising crickets a um, change in my career. For uh, when I was 15 years old, I, along with four other people, started a comic book and game store. Um, we started by selling magic cards out of our backpacks. Grew enough, like, stacked enough cash from that to get a retail location, along with like a responsible 30-something-year-old guy to like pay the bills and stuff. Um, <coughs> and in that space, we were able to create a safe community for highly marginalized people who were at the kind of margins of society. For the last 15 years, I've been working with people in the marginalia um, in a wide variety of different groups, whether they are the forgotten refugee expats, whether they are people in the LGBT community, uh, whether they're Back in the 90s, those nerds who got beat up all the time. Um, I feel like edible insects 
is really just an extension of that same community building. Um, in terms of failures, I would say one of our biggest failures in this first draft was um, not having rigorous enough site assessment. Uh, we definitely, we spent, we did some exploratory trips to Youngstown, Ohio along the way. We didn't listen to uh, the locals well enough, otherwise we would have um, probably chosen a different site. Um, I think we bit off a little more than we could chew in a lot of ways, to be real honest. Um, I think it would have been easier to either focus on raising a lot of bugs or um, and doing what we have done and really bringing this to um, a higher level of awareness or whatever. I hate the phrase awareness, raising awareness. Um, I don't know that we could have done what we did without having Young Sun. Uh, but it was tough, man. I mean, there's no grocery stores. I haven't been to a farmer's market in two years. Uh, I have a mild case of heavy metal poisoning. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, yeah. That was one of the, I would say that was one of the biggest failures. Um, and I would say that portions of the team that I brought on in the initial um, stages were probably not quite as adept as they needed to be. And I include myself in that statement. So yeah.